Yes. All right. Oh, there it says recording. Okay. We are recording. <clears throat> okay, could one of you let folks in? They're coming. Audio. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the April uh, virtual think tank for CalTPA. Um, our focus this uh, month is going to be uh, a an issue that will be coming up for all of us um, in the in the coming months. Is that uh, it's actually already happening, but uh, will be happening more. But that transition to hybrid learning. Uh, from remote settings uh, for candidates. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment so we can see everybody who's here. Um, and it looks like we have a small group. Um, we are going to, uh, the last couple of think tanks we've done um, a little bit of a, they've been brainstorming sessions between folks. And so we're going to follow that mold today. Um, and uh, we will do some introductions. So. Uh, I think I know everybody on screen. My name is Zoltan Sarda. I'm uh, a consultant with the performance assessment, uh, gen ed focused. And I will turn it over to Cassandra next. Okay, make sure I'm not on mute. Okay, good morning. I'm Cassandra Henderson and I'm a consultant with performance assessment focused on early childhood, um, Cal TPA. And James. <laughs> Hi, good morning. I'm James Webb, a consultant with performance assessment development, and my primary focus is on the development and implementation of the education specialist, CalTPA. Charlotte? Good morning. My name is Charlotte Walker. I'm a test development manager um, with Evaluation Systems. How about Deborah? Hi everyone. Um, I am a uh, Cal TPA support person for the Sac County Office of Education intern program. Okay, Mark. I'm not sure. I think you might be muted, Mark. Okay, cannot hear you at this point. While you're fixing that, I will go on to Joe. Um, I'll vouch for Mark. He, he's with me at Cal State San Bernardino. Oh, great. He's one of our leaders. Uh, still can't hear you, Mark. Um, the, the joys of Zoom. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm Dr. Joe Baffa. I have my foot in both worlds of uh, induction, where I work for the Riverside County Office of Education. I'm a program manager for induction. And then I'm also an adjunct professor for Cal State San Bernardino, where I work with the students trying to stressfully complete their TPA. Hey, and Pamela. I am a coach for at SCOE in the SPED department. And so I'm just want to learn as much as I can about the TPA because I know it's coming down the pike and I want to be able to help out with the SPED um, interns. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and Mark, are we? No, I still can't hear you. You want to maybe try logging out and then we'll watch, we'll watch the waiting room for you. Okay. Um, and when you're back in, we'll... Uh, have you introduced yourself? Okay. I will, um, and one of you could let me know when uh, Mark comes back in. Okay. So we'll go back to sharing screen. <clears throat> All right, so again, welcome. Uh, we're, again, this focusing today, I mean, part of this, part of this conversation is really thinking about supporting candidates with the Cal TPA, but uh, this is also, uh, it's a dual focus, I think, is like, how do we support them getting through the Cal TPA, but also how do we just support them moving into these environments where many of our candidates have never been in a real classroom, uh, which I think is a really interesting dilemma uh, for us, all, all of us to face. 
Um, so uh, we're going to move forward from here. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so we got, we've already done a little bit of introductions. Um, and then this idea of defining the problem of practice of supporting candidates as they move into hybrid learning settings. This is the focus, as I said. We're going to break into inquiry groups, but we, um, with us, this is nice to have a small group as well to sort of, we'll just probably stay in one room and do some brainstorming um, around uh, what the needs are for, for candidates and what's out there and what we might need to develop as, as a system of support for, for candidates. Um, and then this idea to um, continue the development of an archive of best practices. So we've, the, the presentations from previous virtual think tanks and the videos are online for folks. So the idea of uh, the collective wisdom of this group coming together and being a resource for um, other people to, to access and to get ideas from and resources from. I think it's, uh, it's, I like that we're building over time a large community of practice that's, that provides support for uh, everyone. Okay. So again, we've already done our introductions. Uh, again, I'm, for those of you who just came in, I'm Zoltan Sarda, a consultant with performance assessment. We have Cassandra Henderson, James Webb and Charlotte Walker from Evaluation Systems. Okay. And Zoltan, just to yeah. let you know, Gina Mandel has joined us okay. and I'm Mark's coming in. So I just wanted to let you know we did have a, another uh, folk join us. Okay. Hi, Gina. Would you like to introduce yourself and your program? There we go. We go. Hello, I'm Gina Mandel. Uh, I'm with Caneo Valley Unified School District. I'm the induction coordinator, um, as well as a mentor. Um, we support, right now we have 56 candidates that we're supporting in our program. And Mark, are you, uh, is your microphone working? No. Oh, no. Still not working. Gina, you are near me. I'm in Santa Clarita, so. Oh, We're not too far away. Is the fire any better over in Thousand Oaks? Yeah, I mean, they evacuated the high school uh -huh. afternoon um, and they were able to pretty much, I mean, it's, I don't know that it's totally out, but it was really, they really knocked it down. They got, oh, they good. got lucky with weather at the end of the day, I think. Oh, um, good. Yeah, because we had one as well and we had a few schools that were affected. So, all right. Well, glad to know everyone's safe. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Zoltan. I didn't mean to no, 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 hijack no. your meeting there. Not at all. Boy, that's becoming a regular thing, isn't it? Unfortunately, in Southern California and Northern California. So, okay. Uh, and we'll look for Mark when he comes back in. Uh, okay. Back to sharing screen. Okay. So, um, once we wanted to start off with just, so this is language that will be posted on the CTC website about, um, that will be in, in some ways an addendum to the COVID guidelines that have been posted there and that are continually being updated as we move through this pandemic. Um, but this idea of what are the, the coming trends in schools um, in shifting towards hybrid settings, um, and the rationale, I think, starting with the rationale from a school perspective is like, why would schools move to this, these kinds of models? One, uh, and this is not a comprehensive list, but so if you have other thoughts about why schools might be doing this, that can become part of the conversation. But, you know, continuing to provide social distancing measures, measures by reducing the number of students that are on campus at any one time is, is a big piece of this. Uh, another one is providing families with choice and flexibility um, depending on their uh, comfort level with their students being in, in spaces. And it provides a transitional model back to, um, back to in-person learning uh, that has some flexibility with it, depending on what's, what's coming. So this language is directly from what we're putting um, on the website. Um, and there are some general, let's look at the mic. So I can read it. There are some general, um, oh, my apologies, I need to go back. OK. 
Okay. So the general guidelines is that whether it, the, for the Cal TPA, um, all just as it's been during the pandemic, all instruction must be synchronous. Students cannot, uh, they cannot record or do document asynchronous lessons. They will not meet the Cal TPA requirements. Um, uh, another sort of big general guideline here, one of the things that will come from different models of hybrid learning is that classes may be divided into multiple groups. So a teacher may have, uh, may be faced with an A group and a B group. One of the questions that we get often from candidates is, is what con constitutes a class, you know, class in quotes, um, because we often think of classes, you know, 20 students in a, in a room, um, and that gets complicated when you have an A and B group. So this idea that uh, if classes are divided into multiple groups, they can choose one of those groups and define that as their class or their small group. So the video clip requirements are the same. You know, one or more students, if um, it says student with a parenthetical S, two or more students if it's seen on the video clips, if it says students, plural. But that idea of them not needing to figure out how am I going to get all the students on my roster uh, documented, but just a portion that I'm working with at a given time. Another big general guideline for, for uh, cycle two, where they're the, having to do a learning segment of three to five lessons with the same group of students. Um, the interpretation of that has always has been sometimes that they have to be on sequential days. So if you teach your lesson one on Monday, you must teach your lesson two on Tuesday and so on. That's not exactly how it works because sometimes those things happen over the weekend. But if you have sort of an A, B schedule, those sequential lessons in that learning segment do not have to be taught on uh, sequential days. So you could do a Monday, Wednesday, Friday approach uh, or a Tuesday, Thursday, you know, approach where that group of students you're working with, you can document over uh, non-sequential days. So, uh, and I'm gonna uh, open up for questions in a moment here, okay. Uh, we have a, a few models. Again, this is not comprehensive, but this is some of the common models that we're seeing happening in schools. Uh, one is that day on day off model where one could, cohort is in, in the building on one day and the other is uh, often doing asynchronous work uh, from home on the alternate day or a half day model where uh, one cohort comes in in the morning and then they go home for their afternoon asynchronous work and then uh, the other group comes in uh, in the afternoon. Um, and again, for this these models, candidates should focus on one of the cohorts of students for their small group or class. And then again, for that uh, cycle two, because the important thing here is that uh, learning segment has to be taught with the same group of students. Um, and then again, as I said, from, from the general guidance that they do not, the, this learning segment can be taught on alternating days or altern yeah, alternating days, okay. One more um, that we're looking at, we have seen where teachers are working in a classroom where some of their students are in the building and some of them are online and they're teaching them simultaneously. So they have a couple of options here. One, they can choose to say, I'm going to document the work with the students in front of me, or I'm going to document the work with the students who are online. They can choose one or the other of those groups. Um, they can also um, document the, the work with the students, uh, both the remote and um, in-person students simultaneously. That would, uh, might require some creative camera work to capture both of those, you know, seeing students on screen and seeing students in person. Although the number of students you need to see still holds, it's, it's going to be um, two or more for students and one or more for student with parenthetical S. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so again, making sure that we're, they're referring to make sure that it's clearly capturing the required number of students. So with that, 
I'm going to stop the share and see if we have some questions about the CTC's guidelines around these models, or if your if your candidates are facing other models, this might be a nice time to bring up some of those pieces as well. Questions, thoughts? Yes, Deborah. Sorry, um, it's. I haven't seen other models other than these. I feel like you captured definitely what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just to confirm actually, but the, um, so the, the, you know, the opening narrative where it's, you know, the about your students, the contextual, that applies to the whole group, even if you've got an A, B group, am I right? Yes. Okay, yes. okay, so, just wanna yeah. double check that. So they, they, and then they can name that they're working with. Uh, As part of their narrative, stuff, right? Stuff okay. Yes. That's, that's, that's helpful, actually thanks. that's useful for the uh, assessors to know what that broader context is. So they should bring that in, ideally. Okay, thank you. Other questions, thoughts about this? Sandra and James, do you have anything to add as well? No, not right. You did a good job with that. <laughs> Yeah, we've been we've been working on the draft of that for a little bit of time here. So, uh, I, I, I do uh, recognize. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no please. Just recognizing. Um, I mean, it's obvious when you have all the permutations on there, right? And you were talking about you referenced at the very beginning that some of some of our interns have never taught in the classroom, and I'm experiencing that right now as they they are navigating that. Um, and so the. Um, the state of what I mean that overwhelm is really high right now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really helpful to let them know. I, I'm just thinking about it because I'm meeting with some groups this coming week and I'm going to use some of this information to let them know what you're think that you're thinking about it, that you know what they're going through. Yeah. I think sometimes they feel like they're on this remote island and they're like, what the heck just happened to my world? So just to know that, you know, all the way along the way, CTC, people with testing, they're all really cognizant of the world that they're in and the unknowns and how it can show up and that you're allowing for all those permutations um, is really reassuring, I think, for them. Okay, well, that, that's good feedback for us. I, I, I can't imagine coming into the profession at this time uh, myself. It's hard enough uh, under- Deborah, have, have you seen some of the, uh, there, there are some YouTube uh, videos of hybrid. Have you seen those or, okay, great. I have, um, and I've been sharing, and I do keep telling, um, I think Pamela can probably say the same, we work together. I tell my interns all the time, especially your ones, and um, but even your twos, like, so here's the deal, you guys, you're still showing up, you're still giving it everything you've got, you're going to be like, this is, doesn't feel like it now, but the fact that you're still committed just speaks volumes to what you're bringing to education in the future, so it's really inspiring Great. to support them. Right, right. Yeah, because there was another one that came out recently from Huntington Beach High School that was really good. Uh, it's a secondary one. Um, I haven't seen it, but I have a lot of secondary people. So Huntington Beach? Yeah, let me okay. find it and I'll put it into the chat. That would be great. And, Thanks, James. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and actually, James, when we get to the Jamboard, I'll just ask you to put it on the Jamboard. Oh, okay, yeah, Ooh. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we're we're going to do activity together, okay? All right, okay. That, that, that's good information. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, let's see. Okay. Back to our presentation. Okay. So we have some guiding questions for this group. And again, I, I think we need to all recognize, you know, us folks here from CTC, we're not experts in this. I don't, you know, everybody's developing expertise as these things uh, fold out. So the question is really to what are, what are the guiding questions we all as a um, teacher development community need to be thinking about. And so I think for, for the rest of this session, I would like us to focus on these guiding questions. Um, first one, what is what are the skills, abilities, and knowledge that candidates will need to have to move into these hybrid learning spaces? You know, again, some of it I think is common to be moving into teaching. Some of it is different, um, and then that you know some of our candidates are facing 
in-person teaching for the first time. Uh, what, uh, what, what do they need? Um, and then I think this, this piece, we've already been talking about it a little bit, um, that of what approaches are transition to hybrid environments and developing these skills, abilities, and knowledge that are so critical. And then that second piece is what are some new approaches that don't exist yet or that you might not have in your program yet that uh, might need to be developed to support candidates in these hybrid environments. Okay. So uh, we are going to, with that, I'm going to uh, stop my share. I'm gonna do a little demo here. So in, I will come back on in a moment. Uh, once I get this uploaded. So as a group, we've, we've been actually doing some fun brainstorming lately in different meetings with using the Jamboard. And I thought it'd be nice to use that uh, for today for us to take a look at uh, bringing our collective knowledge together. So uh, I will share the, the Jamboard with you in a moment, um, but thought sort of basing a discussion around contributing to, uh, to the Jamboard, I'm, this Jamboard around these three questions that we have. I'm just gonna show you very briefly um, how uh, the Jamboard works in this instance. Uh, so if we want to create over here on the left, if you want to create a sticky, you can just write here. I'm going to um, I'm going to put the first one in that came from a previous meeting that we had that some of you were in. Uh, a problem of practice that new teachers are going to have in the settings, which is how to uh, develop community in a hybrid setting. So this is a skill or an ability that they're going to need to develop that might be new for them, uh, or you know, might be new in person if they're fully in person, or it might be new because they're now have students in front of them and students that are uh, not in front of them. And so I'm just gonna save this. And then uh, again, with Jamboard, these can all just be moved around. I think it'd be nice for us to color code these. So if we think about what are the skills, abilities, and knowledge that uh, candidates need to develop, um, and uh, we'll keep those in yellow. What things exist, uh, what approaches and strategies and resources exist that can be used. And I think James, your example of the videos that are available, if you could pop one of those into this Jamboard when we open it up. Sure, yes, I'll do that. And then the blue one is like, what, what do we need to develop? Um, so what I'm gonna do here, stop my share. And then in the chat, I'm going to put the link to this Jamboard. And if you can all click on that. And then uh, from here for the next, I guess we have, let's say 20 minutes or so. Um, I think, feel free to talk, feel free to add. Feel free to draw, draw arrows or shapes uh, or whatever you want around the thoughts that you're having. And maybe, uh, maybe the thing to start with is maybe everybody contribute a thought that you have to one of these, uh, one of these panels. Um, and then we'll just start the dialogue around it. That was James. Thank you, James. Yeah, 
that idea of flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we we'll have to develop and enhance skill sets and tools to navigate two worlds, yes. And that piece of two worlds, they need to be doing that simultaneously in some cases, which is really interesting. Start, I'll start arranging these a little bit. I feel like that's um, part of the art that I've seen this year, honestly, is um, as they navigate back into some site base, they really are um, bringing some of those uh, tech skills and using them in the classroom in a way that really meshes with what they were doing online. Um, and some of the teachers that were really anxious about uh, the, the site based if they hadn't experienced it before, um, you know, being able to reinforce that, hey, you had protocols, routines, structure around your your online, right? Like, because when they didn't, that was something we worked on. And it's transferable, that relationship that they already have along with the routines, even if they change them up for site base. So, um, and when that's lacking, when that um, comfort with technology is lacking, it's, it, it, it's, it's really discombobulating for everybody. <laughs> I just tried to capture what you said as you were speaking and I put that there in this top sticky note. So I guess I should type on, I'll do another one. I think a need is just continued um, availability of um, instruction and sharing around technology and tools and skills in that regard that's not going away. But there is, I see, there is a there is a demand for programs and support to to provide additional tech training. Right? There's certainly been a year of that, but even more. I just think ongoing. It's probably permanent. And then the social emotional learning materials and strategies that probably an emphasis on that in some ways. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't put that sticky note down, but social emotional learning has been such a huge component, obviously, this year. And I, like Deborah just said, I don't think the tech piece is going away. I also don't think, I don't think social emotional is going away anytime soon, because once kids realize they're back in the classroom, um, I think that's going to be another adjustment for students. Um, at every age level, whether it's TK to, to 12 and beyond even at the university level, but I, I just feel like um, that's been huge in it and a support that we could give our candidates is to teach them to integrate it into their lessons, just integration of the social. It's been a huge silver lining, I think, of this year um, in that, I mean, I know where we are, um, I, I teach separately and that's a piece of our ongoing, like all the staff meetings, all the, and it just trickles down like we all use it with our students and then I start my intern meetings with that our director starts our staff meetings with that and 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 seeing how it alleviates well it allows for inclusion and it alleviates a lot of stress um you know I think really models how important it is I mean I think not just in education but everywhere so I love that that's a focus now there is an interesting component too, and you you don't always see the students' faces. Like how much of your, you know, working with students is really just seeing what the their expression looks like and knowing if something is going on for them. Uh, and if we don't always see their faces, like what are the what are other strategies that we can employ to uh, ascertain what's going on for students? Um, Sultan, I did. Deborah had asked for an elementary one. Uh, Deborah, I put in. Uh, there's a example that came out about a month ago from the San Ramon uh, School District. So I put that in there as well. But there's also something with what you're talking about that I read this morning, uh, and I really like it. It's called a restorative restart, you know, to kind of reimagine bringing students back. And um, I'll put it in the Jamboard, but a really interesting brief called Restarting School with Equity at the Center and looking about how uh, to 
reimagine and rebuild. And it was put together by a number of uh, family and student engagement organizations around California. It talks about a blueprint of returning back, but really focusing on social emotional learning, really getting at equity because we know that COVID showed how many inequities exist among our students with regard to broadband and those types of things. So I'll put that on the Jamboard as well. Uh, put that as a need and then you can. Yes, absolutely. And you call it a restorative restart? Yes, I, yes. I, I hadn't thought about that idea and I thought I really like that idea of that restorative restart to our schools. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. That's such a huge piece of the education puzzle. I'd be really interested to read that. I'm interested in the safe place to vent about frustrations. That's, uh, that was mine. That was mine. I, I, in office hours with candidates, I just, I hear the frustrations a lot of them have, the, the fears, the worries. This is so new and different for them in addition to being coming new teachers, right? And so I think they need a safe place to be able to voice that without not looking for a solution, just to get it out. Yeah. I think that's a, it's all, I actually think it's a good practice to teach people how to vent uh, productively and constructively. So it's, Okay. Learning to read students' communication styles, including body language. Yes, absolutely. And then, and then, how do we, how do we create the opportunity if they're not in front of us for, for being able to see that? Okay. This is good. This is nice. Naming some good uh, issues that need to be tackled. Getting some good resources here. What additional is needed? Uh, I think it's important not just to give them that space to vent, which is really, really important. I know my students, we go through that quite often but also a place to share their ideas. You know, I use that Meehan quote in the pink there, but we need to give them time to spend together. Uh, I found recently with my TPA class, I just shut my mic off. And that's a conversation they have because they're all with the same frustrations. And a lot of them are program frustrations and you're right, that does get into venting. But much of it is sharing ideas and strategies and what's going on at their school, what they're seeing. I mean, that, that's just good for everybody. But venting helps. Yeah. Solution-oriented venting. I think something from the induction side is we are so, um, as probably a same with the um, preparation programs, but we're so... Um, guided by the requirements of accreditation. Um, so where we used to have these great seminars for our teachers to connect, you know, they see them as, as PD, so we're not, we can't really do that. Um, so we did, we did do um, what we called like a come visit and share your best practices. Um, so at our induction candidates come share their best practices. Um, and I think oftentimes that's even in a seminar setting or in a PD or whatever you're doing, I, I think that the key is don't, it, it shouldn't be a waste of time. It should be take, take something away from the, that meeting that I can use with my students or in my class or with admin or whatever, in whatever the, you know, whatever the activity or item they take away is. But I think it's important that, that, um, that they get to do that and exchange those ideas because from those ideas come better ideas. And I, and I think that was hugely missed this year. You know, I, I would, I, as an induction program, um, I'm 
I, one of our goals is to provide more experiences like that where they, you know, we used to meet six times a year and have these great meetings and it was a lot of fun. And obviously it was a weird year, but so I'd like to bring those back and maybe frame them a little bit differently. So just throwing that out there. I'm just putting in a post that I, as you were speaking, I tr tried to capture a little bit of what you said, but it sounds like you also have um, something that that is it something in existence that that might might be you, you said bring that back and continue that work even in, in this new normal right I feel free to edit that if I didn't quite capture what you were saying I have a quick question the um, link that James put in for the restorative uh, restart I'm not able to for some reason, I'm not able to copy that and make it work out. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, thank you. I do echo what Gina is saying. The in-person collaborative community spirit is a, more of a challenge to capture. Mm -hmm. um, I do feel like, um, you know, building in, I mean, it's all virtual right now, but building in SEL, I try to bring people together, even when it's not like what we typically would do, um, just to build a little more collaborative. And I've adapt, uh, adopted what you guys do um, in terms of, I always have an interactive um, with whatever I'm doing um, and try not to manage it as much as I'm inclined to do so that they can bubble up um, and share with each other. So your modeling here has again been really helpful to me. So do you use Jamboard for that or some other kind of platform or? Um, I try to vary it every week so that I'm modeling a new strategy for them too, um, nice. or stealing from them. Like, oh, I saw this this week, let's try it. Um, so I, I, I try to do something different every week that I've either seen out and about, or I, I, work, I teach, I've taught um, for the past uh, decade in an online environment. So I borrow from that too. And we just, yeah, or I invite them to, to share one that we could use that they think, you know, they can help me learn. So it's kind of a collaborative that way. Could you um, sort of capture that on a pink sticky? So if people are, we're, we're gonna post this Jamboard so people can see it um, as well as the video. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing that's been super helpful for my teachers is, you know, the use of um, interactive learning platforms like Nearpod, like Pear Deck, you know, Seesaw, all of those across the board have been super helpful this year. Um, and I think those are gonna continue. I think that I think they'll keep using those um, now that they've really got a grasp on them and see that huge amount of resources that are available within all of those learning platforms um, and what you can do with them, so. And there is actually a really benefit. I mean, they're using them as students too. I mean, so, you know, with you, they're using them as students and then they use them with their own students. So it's, uh, that's, that's the best PD actually. Yeah. It's turning into a nice resource. Did we capture, we have basically eight, eight post-its about what are the skills and knowledge abilities that candidates are, are going to need and in moving into these spaces. Did we capture everything? Is there something that's missing there that we that you're thinking about? I think for me, um, I didn't write it down because I don't know really where it fits. Probably fits in all three. Yeah. But for me uh, in induction personally and for our mentors, it's uh, supporting them passing this Cal TPA. <laughs> So uh, I, I have to go in like four minutes and I just wanna leave, leave you all with one thing. And that is, I don't feel confident <laughs> in my abilities to support them with Cal TPA right now because I'm not fully trained. So it's a learning curve for me um, and I'm working on it. Um, I have one teacher that, that submitted and passed and I have another, I only had two that submitted of my, I think I had six that, that have Cal TPA or take that back, six total. I think three had Cal TPA requirements, two chose to submit, one passed, one didn't. Um, and that teacher did not send me the video component to see. So I could say, you know, 
I see last names or I see blank or, you know, just like things that that teacher didn't think about and sent it out to um, CalTPA. So my quick question, and I, and I will leave you with that because I have to, I'm sorry, I have to meet a teacher. But my quick question is, um, if, if I could just break things up just a, a hair. Um, it would be to find out um, when that teacher resubmits are, is, is, is that teacher only going to be evaluated on that component? And are all the other components, since that all the other components were passed, is that the only thing they're going to look at? No, it's the whole submission is re-scored um, by a new assessor. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, and uh, just quickly, in the implementation conference in July, we are going to run a session for people who are new to CalTPA. So we're hoping folks like yourself, like induction people, uh, it, it's really a, a introduction to CalTPA and provide that support um, okay. for people who have been doing it for a while. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've watched the videos, I've walked the teachers through the videos, I've done like all the work, but you know, I, I really, not having years of experience in that puts me at, a, I feel like a disadvantage for them. And fortunately for the teachers, they work with their preliminary programs too. So I'm not the only person in the game with them. But you know, as a as a as a as a coach, I want to be there for them. So Great. I will share. I was new to this this year, Gina, and what really helped me was attending these, but also like being super transparent. Like, hey, I want to support you, but I'm figuring it out. I just always open up the rubrics. I open up the essential documents. I open up the evidence table, and I say, let's look at it together. This is what they're going to be referring to. I haven't assessed for this, but I've assessed for other things and it's like I kind of take myself out of the equation a little bit because I'm not really their answer in the end but I can look at the I can be a second set of eyes is what I always tell them but I always refer I have like it's like my little bible <laughs> and I just look at it because honestly I started out thinking I needed to have the answers for them and I'm like let's look it up if we can't figure it out CTC has office hours let's go yeah. um, we have resources so I, I totally felt that way at the beginning of this year and I've attended all these sessions and they've been so helpful, but also along the way, I've heard people echo your position. And um, I, I think it's reassuring to our candidates that like we're determined to figure it out, but like we got to open it up and look together because part of their learning curve is that they have to, they have to know how to figure out what, where their teaching is too, right? And if they're meeting requirements, it's all there. The rubrics are really pretty clear, so. That pretty clear too and and I did walk that the the candidate through the rubrics and but again you know if it wasn't submitted to me or or shown to me even I how, how can I give any 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 substantial you know feedback and say you know but then they didn't avail themselves of your um yeah. availability and I think that's a less a life lesson right yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely and, and, and Gina, is, yeah. Gina your intent is pure it's obvious and, and you are a great resource for them. And just the fact that you there, that you are there means more than, than you know. Okay, just, good. Just that. Now I can sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I will say, Joe knows this because he comes to the office hours frequently, but Cassandra and I, in office hours, the first thing we do when the candidate asks a question is we pick up the guide and go look for it in the guide because it is, the answers to their questions are almost always there. Uh, so, and that, that, again, that is good modeling. I'll remind myself to get the guide. Thank you all so much. All right. Take care, Gina. Okay. Other, how are we doing with our, um, with the, either identifying the skills, looking at the resources, we've got a pretty good list. I like that we have more resources existing than resources that are needed on the Jamboard. So, additional thoughts? I just have a question. Sure. Will you, um, is this ongoing or was this special for this year? Cause I just came on board this year with TPA is, will there be sessions again next year? Cause I find this really helpful. The virtual think tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I believe these are going to be ongoing. Do James, you know more about that history than I would? Uh, yes, they are. We, we, we do this every year. And every year what we try to do is vary the topics. But one of the things that I'm excited about is that with our work with that specialist, we're going to start to bring things together and maybe spend half an hour on gen ed and then half an hour on ed specialists so that we can start to uh, bring those uh, together uh, and give resources, not just for the gen ed uh, folks, but also for the ed specialists. So. And then we have the office hours, which um, we've gone for programs, we've gone to alternating weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and, but for candidates, we we're sticking with um, every week. Uh, and we're, we're still deciding on that um, as we move forward, but uh, we found those to be um, helpful in a variety of ways, just for people to know that resources are there. Um, it gives you a, a, you know, finger on the pulse too, right? Um, so it, it, I'm sure it's insightful. Yeah, we, uh, uh, several of these think tanks have actually come about because of questions that we hear from candidates, right? Okay. Um, have we exhausted the ideas so far? Should, are there other questions that you have that are not on this topic that would be useful? And we'd also like to hear from you um, thinking about uh, upcoming virtual think tanks. What would be helpful for, for you to focus on as well? Well, I don't know if this is in the wheelhouse, but um, you know, some of the some of the um, like when we talk about assets and needs and funds of knowledge and those kinds of things, depending on the um, you know, depending on the subject matter and the grade level, uh, some of my my candidates really struggle with those areas, and they're probably I know I mean I've watched some videos I've you know, but I'm wondering if there's any more in-depth resources for me to help support some of the key, I mean, they're critical and essential to, to good teaching and I understand that, but how to, how to make it feel like it, so I'm trying to bring, like the TPA is not a one-time deal. It doesn't capture something that's meaningless. Like if you're not doing something in here, it's our chance to talk about it and build it into your best practices, right? Like that's where I come from. Um, and then when they struggle with it to make it authentic or to make it work for their particular group, that's where I could use a little more guidance or resources. I'm not sure if this is an appropriate venue or if you would want to point me somewhere else. Uh, I think both um, would be, could be helpful. Um, that we can definitely put this into the works for future uh, virtual think tanks. Cause that, you're right, that is uh, a concept that is difficult. For you know, depending on the setting and, and level of understanding, in the program guide there is a fairly extensive um, overview, well, synopsis of uh, funds of knowledge, and there are some resources there. So, um, Luis Moll's work, M O L L, his work around funds of knowledge, he takes a real anthropological approach um, to that. Um, but I think the concept of his work is helpful. So it's not just that idea that um, it's not just what do they like and what kind of TV shows do they watch and what kind of food do they eat, but more like what is the, what is the knowledge that the family makes use of? Right. Um, either, I think is- And, and some teachers do it so beautifully and I'll share mm -hmm. their, um, what they've done, even yeah. if it's not re a relevant content area for the person I'm sharing with it. And they'll be like, mm -hmm. I see how that works for them, but I just can't for the life of me. And so I'll, I'll read some more too. That's helpful. Well, I just want to be more knowledgeable and supportive and have more resources in that particular. Well, this, is a, this is a question that comes up and it is a question that I think we see in um, the scoring that it's not, it's for many candidates, it's not the strong point. So um, mm -hmm. this could be a, a, I think this could be a really good, interesting, an, an interesting topic around that. So we're looking at, we um, at SCOE um, are also revising sort of our um, lesson plan to really wrap around like the language in the TPA and the, um, and, and, and that's been really uh, 
helpful for me to work on that project. And part of what I see with that um, in the fall, where we were going to do a sort of training for both our, our coaches and our interns um, and, and really wanting to give some deeper, you know, meaning to some of the really key terms. And so that's partly why I'm asking. We really mm -hmm. want to build, um, you know, for coaches and interns, uh, you know, a really deep understanding of the key best practices and what TPA is looking for. Again, not to, not to necessarily pass the TPA, which is of course like necessary and a goal, but to really instill in them. Like I've had so, so much good feedback for cycle two um, candidates who never used the student self-assess and used it and are like, oh my gosh, like this I'm using forever. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, so it, and then I can say it, see, it does bring up better practice or, you know, additional practices that deepen your um, instruction and student learning, which is really nice to be able to draw that corollary. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, that's, that's so good to hear because that is actually the, you know, the intent of this. There are things placed in here around the TPEs, but then there are around that, there's also specific practices like students up that that's a great example where even five-year-olds can self-assess, you know, it's a beautiful thing and it makes, it does change the game up. Um, and when they see that on their own, it's so, you know, I love for them to come back to our meetings and share back how it changed their, um, their class, their, their teaching and learning. Um, so you're putting a resource for me, sending me a resource. Do you wanna? For, well, for Deborah. Okay. I think you sent it to me. I, I, there's no option for everyone on my thing. Oh, there's not. Okay, let me put. Uh, let me put it. Oh, that's funny. I'll put it into the whole chat for everyone. Thank you, Joe. And Joe, do you want to uh, give a little context on that? I have a couple of, of decent resources on that. One is a short video of Louise Small. Uh, one is like a nine minute video and this girl's passionate about funds of knowledge. It's, it's really well done. Uh, one's an article, one's uh, that you, uh, like a little test that you can take about yourself. So you create your own funds of knowledge. And I think oh, that kind of helps them. Yeah. The one thing that's helped my students, Deborah, is I've explained to them when I learned about Luis Mole, you know, kind of old, so back in the day. Back Me in too. the day, yeah. <laughs> He was contemporary. <laughs> um, you know, he explained it the way I remember, and I could be full of, you know what, but this is the way I remembered it, uh, that they had a parent conference and the teacher's telling these parents, your son really isn't very good at math and he doesn't have any interest in it. And they laughed right in his face because their son would go to LA with produce and he'd go to a right. farmer's market right. and could do percentages in his head. And, you know, he had it all going on. He just didn't care about this guy's math. Right. I love that. And thank you for the resources. And on a similar note, like I have this AP chemistry teacher and he's like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Is this it? And he recounted this. Um, he was talking about chemical reactions and compositions and this and that with his AP chemistry students. And he was also sharing with them like anecdotally to build SEL, right? This is how it all ties together. It's, I told him, Kyle, this is beautiful. So he was explaining to them that he had a total fail with guacamole um, for Super Bowl. And he has a diverse population and they were like all of a sudden flooding the chat with tips about how to how to fix that like brown reaction. And he's like, oh my gosh, like let's bring this back. Like that's what I'm talking about over here. Like if you forget this one component of this equation, it's a fail like my guacamole was. And it was like, right, that was a perfect example. Um, I love the farmer's market example. Well, I will use those resources. Thank you. I had a similar personal story when I was uh, I was deep into reading Louis Small years ago, and I was teaching first grade at the time. And I had a student, Emily. I still remember her, and she said, "You know, my family. We were talking. She knew as I, I was kind of a foodie, and she said my family has a, a store where we sell Spanish uh, foods. You know, different sausages and cheeses from Spain. And so I said, "Oh, come by." And I walked in on a Saturday, and there was. Emily, first grader, running the cash register, and you know, and you know, if you, it, the translation for her to sort of math on paper was a little difficult, but she was just you know making change and doing everything that she needed to do, which was uh, amazing. So, 
So that that part has really stuck for me. I feel like I can use those those couple of stories right off the bat. So thank you for sharing. I always get stuff I can turn around and use when I come to these. I really appreciate it. Okay. Well, we are at three minutes left and thank you um, for that feedback. Let's, let's definitely, uh, we will definitely uh, push towards uh, funds of knowledge um, assets, asset-based learning uh, sessions. Um, that is, first of all, that drives the entire Cal TPA. Um, the, the asset-based instruction. And so spending a little time on that would be, I think it'll be a really good topic. Could, could I just say Zoltan that uh, the funds of knowledge thing, it's, it's got actually kind of fun and you should get to know your class that well, but it's easiest to do in the cafeteria and on the playground and you know in transit. It's yes. really hard to do from Hollywood squares and that's been a challenge for my students. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of unnatural just you, you get in, Rather than a conversation, it feels so it can feel more like an interrogation, right? <laughs> like when you're face to face like this. Zoltan, I hate yes. to do this, but I have to run. I have to go pick up my younger son. Uh, but it was so great seeing everyone. Love the resources, and yeah. just a really good conversation. So thank you all so much. And thank and thank you for again. One of our goals with these is to create this uh, shared community uh, with deep, I mean, we've got deep funds of knowledge here, so uh, we are putting them out. Um, so with that, uh, we will be posting the Jamboard um, and we'll be posting the video. Um, and I hope those are helpful. Thank you for all of your contributions here. And um, with that, we'll see you uh, next time. Thank you. Okay. Take care, everybody. Can I stay on and ask a question? You can. Zoltan, the- uh, Would you like me to stop recording? Uh, it, well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I'll stop recording. Okay. You had sent me that link to uh, for the J July 9th and 10th.